Section 18 of Jane Austen's Juvenilia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Lady Susan, Part Six. Letter Thirty Five. Lady Susan to Mr. De Courcy, Upper Seymour Street. I will not attempt to describe my astonishment on reading the note this moment received from you. I am bewildered in my endeavours to form some rational conjecture of what Mrs. Mainwaring can have told you, to occasion so extraordinary a change in your sentiments. Have I not explained everything to you with respect to myself which could bear a doubtful meaning, and which the ill nature of the world had interpreted to my discredit? What can you now have heard to stagger your esteem for me? Have I ever had a concealment from you? Reginald, you agitate me beyond expression. I cannot suppose that the old story of Mrs. Mainwaring's jealousy can be revived again, or at least be listened to again. Come to me immediately, and explain what is at present absolutely incomprehensible. Believe me, the single word of Langford is not of such potent intelligence as to supersede the necessity of more. If we are to part, it will at least be handsome to take your personal leave. But I have little heart to jest. In truth, I am serious enough. For to be sunk, though but an hour in your opinion, is an humiliation to which I know not how to submit. I shall count every moment till your arrival. S. V. Letter thirty six. Mr. De Courcy to Lady Susan. Hotel. Why would you write to me? Why do you require particulars? But since it must be so, I am obliged to declare that all the accounts of your misconduct during the life and since the death of Mr. Vernon, which had reached me in common with the world in general, and gained my entire belief before I saw you, but which you, by the exertion of your perverted abilities, had made me resolve to disallow, have been unanswerably proved to me. Nay, more, I am assured that a connection of which I had never before entertained a thought, has for some time existed, and still continues to exist, between you and the man whose family you robbed of its peace, in return for the hospitality with which you were received into it. That you have corresponded with him ever since your leaving Langford, not with his wife, but with him, and he now visits you every day. Can you, dare you deny it? And all this at the time when I was an encouraged and accepted lover. From what have I not escaped? I have only to be grateful. Far from me be all complaint and every sigh of regret. My own folly has endangered me, my preservation I owe to the kindness, the integrity of another. But the unfortunate Mrs. Mainwaring, whose agonies, while she related the past, seemed to threaten her reason, how is she to be consoled? After such a discovery as this, you will scarcely affect farther wonder at my meaning in bidding you adieu. My understanding is at length restored and teaches me no less to abhor the artifices which had subdued me, than to despise myself for the weakness on which their strength was founded. R. de Courcy Letter thirty seven. Lady Susan to Mr. de Courcy, Upper Seymour Street. I am satisfied, and will trouble you no more when these few lines are dismissed. The engagement which you were eager to form a fortnight ago, is no longer compatible with your views, and I rejoice to find that the prudent advice of your parents had not been given in vain. Your restoration to peace will, I doubt not, speedily follow this act of filial obedience, and I flatter myself with the hope of surviving my share in this disappointment. S. V. Letter thirty eight. Mrs. Johnson to Lady Susan, Edward Street. I am grieved though I cannot be astonished at your rupture with Mr. de Courcy. He had just informed Mr. Johnson of it by letter. He leaves London, he says, to-day. Be assured that I partake in all your feelings, and do not be angry if I say that our intercourse, even by letter, must soon be given up. It makes me miserable, but Mr. Johnson vows that if I persist in the connection, he will settle in the country for the rest of his life and you know it is impossible to submit to such extremity while any other alternative remains. You have heard, of course, that the Mainwarings are to part. I am afraid Mrs. M. will come home to us again. But she is still fond of her husband, and frets so much about him that perhaps she may not live long. Miss Mainwaring has just come to town to be with her aunt, and they say that she declares she will have Sir James Martin before she leaves London again. 
If I were you, I would certainly get him myself. I had almost forgot to give you my opinion of de Courcy. I am really delighted with him. He is full as handsome, I think, as Mainwaring, and with such an open, good-humoured countenance that one cannot help loving him at first sight. Mr. Johnson and he are the greatest friends in the world. Adieu, my dearest Susan. I wish matters did not go so perversely. That unlucky visit to Langford! But I dare say you did all for the best, and there is no defying destiny. Your sincerely attached, Alicia. Letter thirty nine. Lady Susan to Mrs. Johnson, Upper Seymour Street. My dear Alicia, I yield to the necessity which parts us. Under such circumstances you could not act otherwise. Our friendship cannot be impaired by it, and in happier times, when your situation is as independent as mine, it will unite us again in the same intimacy as ever. For this I shall impatiently wait, and meanwhile can safely assure you that I never was more at ease, or better satisfied with myself and everything about me, than at the present hour. Your husband I abhor, Reginald I despise, and I am secure of never seeing either again. Have I not reason to rejoice? Mainwaring is more devoted to me than ever and were he at liberty, I doubt if I could resist even matrimony offered by him. This event, if his wife live with you, it may be in your power to hasten. The violence of her feelings which must wear her out may be easily kept in irritation. I rely on your friendship for this. I am now satisfied that I never could have brought myself to marry Reginald, and am equally determined that Frederica never shall. To-morrow I shall fetch her from Churchill, and let Maria Mainwaring tremble for the consequence. Frederica shall be Sir James's wife before she quits my house. She may whimper, and the Vernons may storm. I regard them not. I am tired of submitting my will to the caprices of others, of resigning my own judgment in deference to those to whom I owe no duty, and for whom I feel no respect. I have given up too much, have been too easily worked on. But Frederica shall now find the difference. Adieu, dearest of friends. May the next gouty attack be more favourable, and may you always regard me as unalterably yours. S. Vernon Letter 40 Lady de Courcy to Mrs. Vernon. Parklands. My dear Catherine, I have charming news for you, and if I had not sent off my letter this morning, you might have been spared the vexation of knowing of Reginald's being gone to town, for he is returned, Reginald is returned, not to ask our consent of his marrying Lady Susan, but to tell us that they are parted for ever. He has been only an hour in the house, and I have not been able to learn particulars, for he is so very low, that I have not the heart to ask questions. But I hope we shall soon know all. This is the most joyful hour he has ever given us since the day of his birth. Nothing is wanting but to have you here, and it is our particular wish and entreaty that you would come to us as soon as you can. You have owed us a visit many long weeks. I hope nothing will make it inconvenient to Mr. Vernon, and pray bring all my grandchildren, and your dear niece is included, of course, I long to see her. It has been a sad, heavy winter hitherto, without Reginald and seeing nobody from Churchill. I never found the season so dreary before. But this happy meeting will make us young again. Frederica runs much in my thoughts and when Reginald has recovered his usual good spirits, as I trust he soon will, we will try to rob him of his heart once more, and I am full of hopes of seeing their hands joined at no great distance. Your affectionate mother, C. de Courcy. Letter 41 Mrs. Vernon to Lady de Courcy. Churchill. My dear madam, your letter has surprised me beyond measure. Can it be true that they are really separated and for ever? I should be overjoyed if I dared depend on it. But after all that I have seen, how can one be secure? And Reginald really with you? My surprise is the greater, because on Wednesday, the very day of his coming to Parklands, we had a most unexpected and unwelcome visit from Lady Susan, looking all cheerfulness and good humour, and seeming more as if she were to marry him when she got back to town than as if parted from him for ever. She stayed nearly two hours, was as affectionate and agreeable as ever, and not a syllable, not a hint was dropped of any disagreement or coolness between them. I asked her whether she had seen my brother since his arrival in town, not, as you may suppose, with any doubt of the fact, but merely to see how she looked. 
she immediately answered without any embarrassment that he had been kind enough to call on her on Monday, but she believed he had already returned home, which I was very far from crediting. Your kind invitation is accepted by us with pleasure, and on Thursday next we and our little ones will be with you. Pray heaven Reginald may not be in town again by that time. I wish we could bring dear Frederica too, but I am sorry to add that her mother's errand hither was to fetch her away, and miserable as it made the poor girl, it was impossible to detain her. I was thoroughly unwilling to let her go, and so was her uncle, and all that could be urged we did urge. But Lady Susan declared that as she was now about to fix herself in town for several months, she could not be easy if her daughter were not with her, for masters, etc. Her manner, to be sure, was very kind and proper, and Mr. Vernon believes that Frederica will now be treated with affection. I wish I could think so, too. The poor girl's heart was almost broke at taking leave of us. I charged her to write to me very often, and to remember that if she were in any distress we should always be her friends. I took care to see her alone, that I might say all this, and I hope I made her a little more comfortable. But I shall not be easy till I can go to town, and judge of her situation myself. I wish there were a better prospect than now appears of the match, which the conclusion of your letter declares her expectation of. At present it is not very likely. Yours, etc., Catherine Vernon. Conclusion this correspondence, by a meeting between some of the parties and a separation between the others, could not, to the great detriment of the post-office revenue, be continued longer. Very little assistance to the State could be derived from the epistolary intercourse of Mrs. Vernon and her niece, for the former soon perceived by the style of Frederica's letters that they were written all under her mother's inspection, and therefore deferring all particular enquiry till she could make it personally in town, ceased writing minutely, or often. Having learnt enough in the meanwhile from her open-hearted brother of what had passed between him and Lady Susan to sink the latter lower than ever in her opinion, she was proportionably more anxious to get Frederica removed from such a mother, and placed under her own care, and though with little hope of success, was resolved to leave nothing unattempted that might offer a chance of obtaining her sister-in-law's consent to it. Her anxiety on the subject made her press for an early visit to London, and Mr. Vernon, who, as it must have already appeared, lived only to do whatever he was desired, soon found some accommodating business to call him thither. With a heart full of the matter, Mrs. Vernon waited on Lady Susan, shortly after her arrival in town, and she was met with such an easy and cheerful affection as made her almost turn from her with horror. No remembrance of Reginald, no consciousness of guilt, gave one look of embarrassment. She was in excellent spirits and seemed eager to show at once by every possible attention to her brother and sister her sense of their kindness, and her pleasure in their society. Frederica was no more altered than Lady Susan. The same restrained manners, the same timid look in the presence of her mother as heretofore, assured her aunt of her situation's being uncomfortable, and confirmed her in the plan of altering it. No unkindness, however, on the part of Lady Susan appeared. Persecution on the subject of Sir James was entirely at an end his name merely mentioned to say that he was not in London, and in all her conversation she was solicitous only for the welfare and improvement of her daughter, acknowledging in terms of grateful delight that Frederica was now growing every day more and more what her parent could desire. Mrs. Vernon, surprised and incredulous, knew not what to suspect, and without any change in her own views, only feared greater difficulty in accomplishing them. The first hope of anything better was derived from Lady Susan's asking her whether she thought Frederica looked quite as well as she had done at Churchill, as she must confess herself to have sometimes an anxious doubt of London's perfectly agreeing with her. Mrs. Vernon, encouraging the doubt, directly proposed her niece's returning with them into the country. Lady Susan was unable to express her sense of such kindness, yet knew not from a variety of reasons how to part with her daughter, and as, though her own plans were not yet wholly fixed, she trusted it would, ere long, be in her power to take Frederica into the country herself, concluded by declining entirely to profit by such unexampled attention. Mrs. Vernon, however, persevered in the offer of it, and though Lady Susan continued to resist, her resistance in the course of a few days seemed somewhat less formidable. The lucky alarm of an influenza decided what might not have been decided quite so soon. Lady Susan's maternal fears were then too much awakened for her to think of anything but Frederica's removal from the risk of infection. Above all disorders in the world, she most dreaded the influenza for her daughter's constitution. 
Frederica returned to Churchill with her aunt and uncle, and three weeks afterwards Lady Susan announced her being married to Sir James Martin. Mrs. Vernon was then convinced of what she had only suspected before, that she might have spared herself all the trouble of urging a removal, which Lady Susan had doubtless resolved on from the first. Frederica's visit was nominally for six weeks, but her mother, though inviting her to return in one or two affectionate letters, was very ready to oblige the whole party by consenting to a prolongation of her stay, and in the course of two months ceased to write of her absence, and in the course of two more to write to her at all. Frederica was therefore fixed in the family of her uncle and aunt, till such time as Reginald de Courcy could be talked, flattered, and finessed into an affection for her, which, allowing leisure for the conquest of his attachment to her mother, for his abjuring all future attachments and detesting the sex, might be reasonably looked for in the course of a twelvemonth. Three months might have done it in general, but Reginald's feelings were no less lasting than lively. Whether Lady Susan was, or was not happy, in her second choice, I do not see how it can ever be ascertained, for who would take her assurance of it on either side of the question? The world must judge from probability. She had nothing against her, but her husband, and her conscience. Sir James may seem to have drawn an harder lot than mere folly merited. I leave him, therefore, to all the pity that anybody can give him. For myself, I confess that I can pity only Miss Mainwaring, who, coming to town and putting herself to an expense in clothes which impoverished her for two years, on purpose to secure him, was defrauded of her due by a woman ten years older than herself. End of Lady Susan End of Jane Austen's Juvenilia